Hey, it's Joe. What would you ask if you got a chance to talk to a PhD who's a retired academic researcher in multiple areas of human physiology, was a professional athlete in two sports, has been a lifelong bodybuilder, and who now is coaching top-level athletes and older, high-performing athletes around the world? What would you ask him? Well, when I got my chance to talk to Dr. Dwayne Jackson, I decided to take a deep dive into inflammation to get Dr. Jackson's advice on how regular people like you and me can stop chronic inflammation from reducing our ability to perform and recover and to improve our health along the way. Dr. Jackson even shared his secret breakfast feast that I have been eating every morning ever since. Be ready to take some notes. All right, let's talk to Dr. Dwayne Jackson. Be sure to share this episode with your friends. Dr. Dwayne Jackson, welcome to the Wise Athletes Podcast. Thanks, Joe. It's a pleasure to be on here, and thanks so much for inviting me to chat today. Absolutely. Hey, you're one of those guys. Let's make sure everybody knows. First of all, you got that PhD thing going. Was that exercise physiology? What's your PhD in? Yeah, so my, my PhD is in neurovascular physiology, but the actual essence was uh, to study muscle blood flow in males and females and look at how um, blood flow is regulated at the microcirculatory level, uh, which is a little bit different than when we talk about big, big blood vessels because the microcirculatory level, we distribute red blood cells and uh, we separate the plasma from the red blood cells, which a lot of people don't know, even exercise physiologists. And so uh, my area of study was really trying to understand um, how we regulate the distribution of red blood cells to active muscle fibers mm. and what that looks like in aging and disease and these kind of things, because, well, uh, as you, as you well know, we, uh, when we get older, we don't perform quite at the same, um, with the same ability, I guess we could say, yeah. as we do when we're, you know, in our, in our twenties doing the same thing. So always interested in that. And then I was interested in the sex differences because, um, females and males regulate a lot of the cardiovascular system in different ways. Hmm. So it was it was an unknown thing um, in terms of regulation of arterioles, how males and females really did this action. Wow. Well, I had no idea. To the extent that that becomes relevant to our talk today, I hope you will educate us all. You were at university for a long time. You said you were there from like 19 to 50? Yeah, 19 to about 48, 49, yeah. Okay, so you learned a few things. So you're not just, you know, guy got a PhD and then blew out into the business world. You stayed, you were a researcher, teacher, obviously, as well. And do I understand right that you were also a professional athlete? So as a pro motocross racer, I also raced pro uh, sea dudes, actually, funny enough, after I raced motocross. Um, sea dude, was- that's like a jet ski? Yeah, like a jet ski, but a sit down, you know, like, like the, uh, oh. like, like they call them runabout class. So you had jet ski class where you're sta- they're stand-ups and they had the sit downs. Sit downs were a little faster. Wow. So yeah, so so I actually got into pro boat racing um, just as I was getting into my undergrad, wow. and then um, and then I, then I then I then that became a little bit cumbersome because uh, I had to travel too much. Yeah, yeah. And then you got into bodybuilding. Uh, I mean, I started bodybuilding seriously at the age of fourteen. Wow. Um, but that's because I uh, when I turned pro in motocross, I was a lot younger than most of the guys, um, and so um, I my body I had some body size on me. And so, um, I started training like, you know, in my basement, like every kid with the weeder, you know, weeder set and the, uh, Arnold, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger encyclopedia of bodybuilding as my guide, Yeah, my copy covered in duct tape and marker and everything else. Sweet. And, um, yeah, so I started, I started then. And then when I, um, when I was getting ready to wrap up my motocross career, I was actually pretty serious into it. When I wrapped up my motocross career around, uh, 19 years old, I'd already actually had a, uh, um, bodybuilding competition under my belt. So it was, it was actually really nice because probably most of your listeners could um, relate to this, including yourself. Um, I had to lead motocross uh, because of injury. Hmm. And for me, that was tough. My dad always said like, you know, one day you're going to get up off the ground with a compound fracture, torn knee, we had multiple lows and, and just say like, you know, I'm done. Hmm. So it was funny because uh, motocross was a big one for me. And that's what set the pace for nutrition, set the pace for what I wanted to do in university. And so I went off to university in like, yeah, 92, 93. 
bodybuilding became my passion. Mm. I bodybuilt for 30 years, um, competed pretty much every year. And I went from lightweight all the way to open class, 260 pound guy. Wow. Yeah. Until I was about uh, 34, 35. And then I started having kidney issues. Oh. And that was well as a professor at that point. Bodybuilding was, was kind of like a thing that was the staple in the background that kind of ran. And then when I wasn't racing bicycles as well as at Yale or, you know, riding my mountain bikes, then I would get focused on doing a bodybuilding show. Uh-huh. So it really, um, I never went pro in bodybuilding. Um, I, 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 in fact, it was one of those sports where I actually didn't care to. I wanted to hit 300 pounds is what I wanted to do. Of muscle. Yeah. I made it shy of that by about 40 pounds until, you know, I wrecked all my, wrecked all of my uh, musculoskeletal system motocross and then started working on the organs, the body. And, uh, and so, so yeah, so, so um, all the way through my undergrad, I, I was right into the, uh, the athletics, um, all the way through my master's and PhD too. Um, I really enjoyed the professor stuff, but I outgrew it like everything in my life. Mm. <laughs> so I just packed her up. My kidney, uh, my kidney started failing from bodybuilding. Uh-oh. I packed it all in and said, let's move out west. Well, what are you doing now? Now, yeah, so I'm retired, but uh, I'm busier than I've ever been, like you always hear. Um, so moved to the far west, farthest west you can go in Canada on the um, uh, Vancouver Island. We've, we're in the rainforest. And I just started working with, I mean, to be honest, I was already working with a number of high-end athletes and um, high performers in general in life. So business people, former business people who now want to, you know, get out there and live their lives. But basically people, people who are, uh, you know, in that kind of 40 plus crowd who um, now have, you know, some, some cash to throw at some stuff. And now they're looking to, to either, you know, pick up a sport that they never did before, pick up activity they would never done before, or, um, you know, just optimize their, their being on this earth. So um, I use a biopsychosocial approach to everything. And so, um, as you know, most people who are good at what they do know that it's not just about having the right diet or having the right uh, mindset, but it's, 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 it's more so the blend of uh, the dynamics of our biology, our psychology, and our so- social life that really meld our lifestyle into either being completely screwed <laughs> or performing really, really well and living long. That's where I'm now. And to be honest, it organically developed. I, I really didn't want it to get this big, but it's in my nature to, you know, take things a little bit far. And uh, to be completely honest, this is the first time in my life, you know, the last couple of years that I've been able to have my stuff make a freaking impact. Hmm. So this is lovely. I love being able to, uh, to, to be able to share my anecdotes, my experience and my you know, knowledge with the general population now directly. Um, it's, it's so lovely. Well, that's awesome. And that's what we want to do here today. Um, you, and you are one of those rare people who really can walk the walk and talk the talk. You're, you're an older athlete yourself. You have studied the science and know it very well. And you also have experience with yourself, but also with other people in solving real problems that real people have, in particular older people and athletes and older athletes. And so that's me and people listening here today. I mean, a a very common problem that I have when I find people like you is it's like, oh gosh, how do I get all of your knowledge onto this tape? And we just do do multiple podcasts. That's all we do. That's the only thing that we could possibly do. Usually have to pick something. And what I thought we would talk about here today is inflammation. This idea of like inflammaging, I guess, maybe is the word that uh, has, has sort of cropped up in this low grade chronic thing that seems to be related to getting older. I think that maybe it could be exacerbated by, you know, people not exercising enough. And then there's no doubt there's all kinds of influences of the thing, but the, you know, the hallmarks of aging, there's 12 things now, I guess it was nine, now there's 12. And one of them is this inflammaging. You know, if we can with your expert guidance, 
start to understand, well, what is that? Where does that come from? And what can we do about that so that we can be healthier and stronger as athletes and be stronger as athletes for a long time longer? That would be a great help. Well, that you've come to the right place. And in <laughs> <laughs> um, funny enough, it's, it, it's kind of neat because um, when we look at inflammation, it's really wild that we're only really starting to consider it, and at least in the general population, like, you know, in the last five years or so, it's been kind of the, the buzzword. But inf- inflammation is the underlying, uh, one of the underlying mechanisms, um, at least, at least um, unresolved, unknown cause inflammation, let's call that first, is uh, the underlying um, issue with most of the aging diseases that we, that we see, if you want to call them that. And so when we look at things like everything from thyroid dysfunction, you know, right through to cancers and these kind of things and actual diseases that can, you know, take us to bad places, cardiovascular disease, these things, inflammation is a hallmark of all of those situations. Mm -hmm. And so first off, we probably should define inflammation for your listenership in a simple way. Yeah. Um, so it really, it's just a biological response to the immune system or by the immune system to harmful stimuli. It might be a pathogen of some sort or a damaged cell or an irritant in the air or whatever it is. Um, but it's a protective mechanism that's aimed at eliminating that initial cause of cell injury. And it clears out all the necrotic cells, the dead cells and uh, the tissues that are damaged uh, from that original insult. And then it starts initiating that tissue repair that we need when we have the damage. So it can be either acute or chronic. Generally, acute inflammation is a short-term response. And that's when we, you know, if we bang our hand or, or cut ourselves and we'll get redness, heat, swelling, yeah. some pain, try to, to mobilize it. And that involves the activation of immune cells like neutrophils and macrophages, ones that kind of come in there and do things quick. And chronic inflammation, on the other hand, which is what we're more talking about, we talk about disease, states, and these kind of things, It's a prolonged inflammatory response that leads to more tissue damage and has been associated with those chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer. And so really inflammation is a good thing if it's actually under the right controlled circumstances that it prevails in. So one of the, when we talk about aging or inflammation, the Real, um, I guess the the type of uh, inflammation that is is what we call low grade systemic inflammation, okay. and this is this is kind of a new thing in, in inflammatory responses because this one's a chronic inflammatory response, but it's subtle. It's a persistent state of inflammation. And it's characterized by the uh, like the presence of elevated inflammatory markers in the bloodstream and those things, but there's not. No real overt symptoms that are typically associated with acute inflammation. It's often a, we call it like a subclinical condition, meaning that it doesn't present with obvious symptoms, but can contribute to the development of chronic diseases over time. Mm. And this type of inflammation is usually linked to like lifestyle factors, poor diet, too little physical activity or too much, obesity, uh, chronic stress, stuff I studied. Um, and it's been associated with things like atherosclerosis. So one of the things that you know, some of our, some of the listeners out there right now are probably have had a calcium score that's high or something. Yeah. Um, atherosclerosis, insulin resistance as we get older, metabolic syndrome, um, and then neurodegenerative diseases that we see, which can be exacerbated by underlying athletic problems like concussions and whatnot, right? Ooh. So really, you know, in athletes though, Barring any uh, disease state that they have, it's generally an issue, this low-grade systemic inflammation is generally an issue with training and or dietary status and or gut health issues. Gut health. So, you know, if we're, if we're painting the landscape here um, for the athletes, we're talking about with inflammation, uh, we're talking about situations where we have this chronic low-grade inflammation. We haven't optimized our inflammatory responses, likely due to a mismatch between our output from exercise and our recovery from sleep, 
eating, wherever we want to put it. When we have these issues, they become exacerbated or when we create this environment, but it exacerbates underlying autoimmunity problems and all the issues associated there. So hmm. when you think about inflammation, you should think of it almost like a, for lack of a better term, like a gas gauge. I use waterline. Like if we, if we had video going right now, I'd have a hand on my nose right now and I'd be showing mm. up. My chest. So waterline's a nice one. And basically you want to keep your head above water all the time with the inflammatory responses. And that's, that comes with keeping your head above water with stress, you know, and also maximizing your recovery through good sleep, diet, and everything else. And so the whole key behind this whole thing is knowing your state of health at any moment in time and knowing if you have a, if you have allergies, for example, that are immune system um, stimulants, mm. or you have an autoimmune disease, then you know then you need to make sure that as these uh, inflammatory insults show that you're doing everything in your power to not add insult to injury by increasing inflammation with things that you can control. Like mm. I said, like stress, sleep, eating, these things. So for any aging person, we need to really be privy to the things that we can control so that we don't end up in states of higher inflammation than we actually should be in given whatever that baseline is that we have. And a lot of people don't know what that is hmm. because, you know, for athletes, we kind of try to do things like we did when we were 20 because it worked. And there's a subconscious program that like, why am I not getting any better? If you're not optimizing your biopsychosocial aspects of health or performance, then you're not getting the most out of your aging process. When I say getting the most out of your aging process, it's like you're not living as full as you can, e even if you're doing the sport you want. Well, that's interesting. Let's try to walk through this stepwise. You had said that it's not easy to tell. If I twist my ankle, my ankle swells up, it gets red, it hurts. So that's the acute inflammation. And I don't get that exact sort of thing with chronic inflammation. But maybe there are some symptoms that anybody listening could say, oh, that sounds like me. What would you say to people? At the front end, most people won't really know they're having any sort of inflammatory insult if it's chronic low-grade stuff without having, first of all, some sort of indication, some sort of symptom and or blood work. So symptoms generally, um, the, the problem with like brain fog, the problem with um, using, um, you know, performance um, or any of those things as a surrogate for inflammatory status. The problem is there's so much, so many other things going on at the same time. I see. Right? So it could be that, it could be a 10,000 other things. Absolutely. And it's funny, you get these, you know, um, and I, I teach courses on all this stuff. I have my own like uh, courses that I teach in gut health, in digestion, in um, body composition manipulation. And it's funny because the underlying thing behind all this comes down to how we digest and how we poop if we want to have a, a, you know some sort of sign of inflammatory stuff so that's interesting basically if your digestion if you're if you notice that some days you don't feel digestively well than others maybe it might be a little bit constipation maybe it might be a little bit of diarrhea maybe it's a little bit of both maybe it's soft serve poops that aren't quite diarrhea but the point is if you have a kind of a fluctuating output of food from the mm -hmm. poop and you also have fluctuating feelings when you eat. So feelings of bloatedness, feelings of fullness when you shouldn't be, prolonged fullness, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Then generally speaking, there's a target for us to actually manipulate right off the get-go. And that makes it really easy. And it's pretty simple to figure out, you know, if your diet is going to support anti-inflammation or, or if it's supporting pro-inflammation by really just looking at a lot of the foods that you are eating. Hmm. That would be my first place to look. 
at the same time, and I'll get to those foods in a bit, but at the same time, I would also look at training status, where you are, where, where are you in your training status? Because if you are in a very, very heavy training period and your dietary status isn't supporting that training, that will drive inflammation also through a process called red S. Under eating would be the red S, but maybe if you are overeating, you're going to get some inflammation as well. Absolutely. So with red acid, yeah, it's either overtraining or under eating. And I always say that you're under eating. Like if, if you can digest it and assimilate it, you can support the, the anabolic effects of recovery to, to get back. There's that, but then there's also right overeating and overeating can be a stress in its own, especially if we're eating foods that are high in uh, macronutrient density, but not so much micronutrient density. So mm. we're talking about to give a great example would be like fast food, right? And what we find is that although nutrient uh, intake or caloric intake has gone up in the general population, nutrient deficiencies actually exist despite having overloaded calories. And that's mm-hmm. strictly because a lot of the foods that are eaten really are they're calorie dense, but they're not micronutrient dense. So, mm-hmm. so right off the bat, right, you can just have a micronutrient deficiency. Vitamin D, for example, is a magic one, right? If it's low and you start you get it pumped back up. It's like, wow, what did you do for me for you know 18 bucks a can, right? <laughs> really, it's uh, at the front, the very front end. As an athlete, most athletes know what I'm talking about here when I say this. Look inward and see, are you doing your best with your diet? Yeah, I would guess that people know, they know body comp and performance drives people to wanting to get control over how much they're eating you start cutting things out. What I find is that I'm cutting out all the things that are the best for me. I don't want to cut out my protein shake, (laughs) right? No, exactly. exactly. The the, the only, you know, it's funny. um, So I I formulate supplements for most of the big brands out there. So I'm a supplement guy. However, supplements are like, especially like protein shakes and stuff like that. They're just, they're just another processed food, right? Which is a healthy processed food, but being processed for example, whey protein, right, isn't the same as, you know, doesn't have the same nutrient value as, say, milk. However, we're not going to drink a gallon of milk to get, you know, the same thing out of the whey protein that we were trying to get, you know, with that. So calories are neat, though, because, um, and this is a little off inflammation, but it does, it does when we're undercaloried or overcaloried, this becomes a problem. So if we're overcaloried to the point where we start gaining fat, hmm. so anybody that's got, you know, If they're sitting as a male somewhere in like the mid 20% body fat plus, especially when we get to like 30, 40% body fat Mm -hmm. Um, and females, you know, 30, 40, 50% body fat. One of the issues is is that the body fat itself produces uh, these adipokines, which are just cytokines coming from adipose tissue and cytokines are those, you know, interleukins and everything else that we talk about that increase inflammation or decrease it depending on what they are. Body fatness or increased body fatness increases the amount of inflammatory cytokines that get released from it. So if we're holding, like, we're talking about an abundance of body fat here, it's like for different sports, we need body fat, right? Mm-hmm. But if we're holding an abundance of body fat, so we'll know what that is if, if we're that athlete, then we, are, then we are also putting ourselves at risk doesn't mean it's going to happen, but at risk for low-grade inflammation because of that cytokine effect. Not only that, but as we age and we, if we gain body fat, which does happen, or and even our body comp starts, you know, we lose muscle to gain more you know, body fat percentage relatively. Mm-hmm. Um, as that changes, we also, that body fat also contains these uh, things called aromatases and enzymes. And those aromatase enzymes are what, um, a chew up testosterone hmm. to make estrogen, which we find that estrogen becomes an issue in, in you know, body fat. Is. And then also um, increases um, 5 alpha reductase, which is um, what breaks testosterone down to dihydrotestosterone, which um, then causes male pattern baldness and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, hmm. so really, and, and, and problems with our prostate and everything else. So when we look at the whole kind of milieu of where the athlete diet um, and um, exercise or performance ex- sits, it really becomes really highly focused 
as diet as a central, you know, theme hmm. and getting enough calories in is very, very important because we'll undergo metabolic adaptation if we don't, or if we push it so far um, and uh, that we, that we go into red S, which is that relative energy deficiency, then we end up with a whole bunch of inflammatory issues and all kinds of stuff that is really hard to spin out of because we're afraid of gaining weight if we increase our calories. Hmm. And so the key really for, you know, for these, these states is to understand what your expenditure is during, you know, any, any bout, have just a good idea what your expenditure is during your bouts of exercise and adjust accordingly. Because if you're adjusting downward all the time to lose body fat, you will have a propensity to actually stagnate at the weight that you're sitting at. Hmm. And that's strictly because of that metabolic adaptation, which is a result of lower thyroid hormone, lower levels of leptin, decreases in anabolic hormones like testosterone, increases in catabolic hormones like cortisol. And so we're actually in the opposite side of where we want to be. Gosh, I guess everything comes together in the end, but this sounds very connected to some uh, earlier episodes that I had where we're talking about trying to thread the needle on how do I put on muscle and lose body fat at the same time. And gosh, isn't that hard to do? And here, I think we're talking about more variables, right? We're not just talking about losing the fat, but gaining the muscle, but also having good digestion so that we have good elimination. And maybe um, you haven't said it yet, but I think maybe thinking in terms of like leaky gutness and stuff getting through and, and aggravating your immune system inflammation. How, so how do you thread this needle? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Oh, okay. I got the right guy. So what we got to do is boil it down to kind of like the finest elements and then get into the minutia, right? So first of all, we don't get caught up in minutia, all right. right? The key to this, the whole idea of feeding yourself for sport and keeping inflammation low yeah. is to not increase digestive distress. And so um, so you don't force feed, you don't do any of these things. We mindfully eat, which a lot of people are eating on the run all the time. Funny enough, when we talk about stress, the first place that we pull blood from is digestion when we exercise. Mm. That's why we don't eat a steak and eggs. Well, some people do, but right before we do a Wingate test or right before we do something, it's going to take a max effort. Because we're going to pull max cardiac output from the splanchnic region, the, the, the gut, in order to redistribute blood to the active muscles. And we still have to get the stuff to the head, right? Mm. So we have to drive pressure up. We have to redistribute blood because we only have five to six liters to go around. And we're, you know, our cardiac output's exceeding that. So the key to all this, when we talk about digestive distress, is to eat meals that don't inflame the guts, which is going to be really, really important. And for people that find that they have uh, sensitivities to different foods, um, then they're going to gain the most benefit from being able to circumvent those different sensitivities. So here's what we need to do. So the first thing that anybody that you know is concerned with their diet in terms of inflammation is, is concerned, they, they need to first take a look at their poop. Hmm. So if they download just Google Bristol stool chart, B-R-I-S-T-O-L, um, stool chart, uh, then they can go in there and figure out where they sit on average with their poops. If their poops are not frequent, they're constipated for what, a day, two days, three days at a time, or they're too frequent and they don't meet uh, type four or so on, on the Bristol stool chart, then right off the bat, we know that we have some sort of likely large intestinal inflammation. <laughs> and that is generally driven by, the term is dysbiosis, but basically not enough uh, commensural bacteria, happy bacteria, um, living happily with the bad bacteria, good bacteria, just doing their job. Those aren't, in the large intestine, aren't balanced or optimized. And generally speaking, if you eat a diet of the same thing over time, you will end up with a very, very non-diverse or limited microbiota um, or bacterial uh, load 
and it won't be super duper dense because there's a high likelihood that by eating less variety that you're going to be um, then selecting for certain bacteria at a certain rate of growth. So we want good bacteria to play well in the sandbox with bad bacteria in the colon. So I'm going to use my grass analogy here. Hopefully we're older athletes. So all of us have had this at one point in our life, had an obsession with our lawn. Uh -huh. So when you do your grass, what you do is you take a look at your grass and then you see, oh yeah, I got a few weeds in here and everything. And so you overseed that thing in the fall and spring or whatever your plans are. You water it and you fertilize it regularly, right? And the idea is that by doing so, we select for the grass, right? And we don't select for weeds. So then the grass ends up over occupying the lawn and takes over the weeds. The key here also is not to cut the lawn too short. Right, you got to cut the lawn. I stay like three inches or so, because we need it to be abundant and have lots of chances to to, to be able to get photosynthesis and do its job. Okay, so the guts are similar. If we think about um, our large intestinal microbiota as a lawn, right, and we think of grass seed as a probiotic or a probiotic food, like fermented foods, like you know yogurt, kefir. Um, uh, different uh, sauerkrauts and stuff like that. And so if we think of our our, our, um, our our the lawn seed that we put down as those those bacteria, and we think of the fertilizer that we put on our lawn as fibers, soluble fibers mainly, then we can easily reestablish the microbiota balance or microbial balance in the large intestine, and mm. that will automatically decrease inflammatory responses to food, which then over time, because food and eating is a chronic condition, we decrease the amount of inflammation caused by the diet. And we don't even need leaky gut to have an issue with diet causing certain inflammatory responses, especially as we get older and our mm. immune systems get a little more fickle, we'll call it sensitive to mm. things, not sensitive to other things. So the key is, is fiber and probiotic foods. And so I'm going to give your listenership right now a task, regardless of whether they think their diet's perfect or not. Okay. okay. First off, track your diet. If you already do, great, then check. But if you're a female and your fiber isn't above 28 to 30 grams, then right off the bat, you're not feeding those bacteria enough soluble fiber. Hmm. For males, same thing, 38 to 40 grams. Most of my athletes, when I start with them, are eating around 12 to 15 grams of fiber per day. Mm. Doesn't matter whether they're male or female. And by the time I get them, you know, within six to eight weeks without any, you know, major issues into their diets, they'll be eating more than 40 grams. Okay. So a couple of months worth to ramp up. That's right. Usually give yourself six weeks. So that, so the key is that fiber. Second thing. Well, on the fiber, is it supplement? The whole food diet. Okay. All right. Whole food diet. Now, this is where it gets tricky because most people will be staying away from foods that make them sensitive, especially fibers. And so that means that vegetable load will likely either be non-existent, mediocre at best, or really, really stuck to broccoli or really, really stuck to carrots, or really, you know, but, but no variety. So basically eat like your mom or your dad or whoever raised you did in the 70s. Like, it's like, you know, oh, you can't just have broccoli. You need you know, carrots and cauliflower because you need the colors. Fuck, they need something. <laughs> the <laughs> rainbow. Eat the rainbow, huh? Eat the, and Okay, so the rainbow, the reason why we eat the rainbow is literally because the polyphenols, the antioxidants and whatnot that actually create the color are all beneficial to the guts too. So mm -hmm. fiber feeds the fi fiber will feed the bacteria and colonize it. Um, but also polyphenols from berries and colorful vegetables feed the microbiota. And 
So we know a lot more now than just like, you know, eating the rainbow, but it's funny how that was something that stuck because they trusted it because it worked and people pooped well and everything felt good. So fiber, really important from whole food, if you can handle it. And so what I would recommend for your, your listenership when they're increasing their fiber, start with flax, milled flax, not, not whole flax, milled flax, because whole flax has insoluble fiber on the outside. So we swallow it and we poop it out. You see it in the toilet. This goes right through you. Grinder up and it's functional because now you're getting all those great omega threes and omega sixes and everything else that are in the flax, as well as the soluble fiber that's inside it. So ground flax, right off the bat, if you add, you know, two tablespoons a day, it's very easy on the guts, but you also get the benefits of the anti-inflammation from the omegas. Two tablespoons a day, get that in you. Um, and then on top of that, try to eat like a meal that has some oats or something like that in it because oats are generally very, very good um, on, the, on the guts regardless of the status. Mm. Um, and, uh, and you'll get some really good fibers and beta glucans and stuff like that. that help. And does it matter the kind of oats like steel cut? Is that better than, you know, instant? Yeah. So uh, uh, great question on that too, man. Um, yeah. So, so the uh, large, large flaked oats, like old fashioned oats are generally the best. I would say, I would say hundred percent of my clients, what I do is I start them out with a, like an overnight oats type thing. And, um, and it's funny cause I have a lot of like pro bodybuilders and pro pro like power lifters and stuff. These guys like, yeah. like, you know, they, they eat foods that are cool. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of funny, ironic too. Um, but, but, but anyway, so, so the, um, so we make overnight oats. So, so here's a good recipe cause you can make this and you can make five days, you know, in a row and then you don't have to worry about preparing it. Put a cup of oats or half cup, adjust it for your macros. But basically, I put a cup of oats, a tablespoon or two of flax, a tablespoon of two or two of uh, chia seeds, um, flax, make it milled. Chia doesn't really matter much. It's very soluble. Um, and then add in, you know, uh, 14 or 15 grams of a nut of your choice. Hmm. Throw in... Also, um, any sort of, um, depending on how, how high you want your carb load to be, um, any sort of like, you know, dried fruit or whatever. We use a lot of dried cherries out here, the antioxidants. And then throw that sucker in the, or sorry, uh, put in um, a, a cup or a little more of the milk of choice that you use. So if it's almond milk or cashew milk, it doesn't really much matter. I like whole milk. Um, I'm, I'm just a milk kind of dairy kind of guy. Throw that sucker in the fridge. And let it sit overnight. And if you make five of them, you'll have five days worth. Pull it out in the morning, scoop it out into a bowl. And then on top of that, throw half a cup to a cup of blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then put in a scoop of a real high quality whey protein isolate. And then a couple little touches of a little more of the milk you use. Stir that sucker together and eat that. And that's going to give you anywhere, depending on how you put it together, 17 to 35 grams of protein right off the bat, or sorry, 70 to 35 grams of fiber right off the bat. Mm. Now, adjust accordingly, but it's, that's a very, very, what we call a low FODMAP fiber load. Wow. So it's low FODMAP, high fiber. Yes. So the fibers in it are from low FODMAP foods, but highly functional and this has been like kind of my secret weapon for, for years. Um, and uh, I do a coaching the coach program. And it's funny when coaches come to me, uh, you know, with bodybuilders and whatnot, I give us some, like, how am I going to feed them this? And I'm like, force them to eat it for a week. And after they take, you know, two solid poops a day for a week, they'll be like, oh yeah, I got, I, I can do, I can do over it. It's, 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 it's amazing. So, so it sounds delicious. Yeah. And, it's, and that's actually as basic as it gets, you know, I end up adding a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, the odd time, but just, Listenership, do that, and you know, call me in the morning. Start with that. Um, I would also start with because we were talking about supplements and whatnot, right? Mm. I would also start with a probiotic and mm. a, a high quality one. Now, if you listen to my podcast, I talk when I talk about this stuff. I always say this, but like, and I still have a whiteboard behind me. I gotta get a hold of this company to get them to help me out. With stuff, give you guys a deal because I, they, I have no affiliation with this company, but they have an amazing product. Okay. There's a product called Visbiome. In North America, it's called Visbiome, B I S B I O M E. Okay. And it's one of the only clinically, like true clinically studied probiotics. It used to be actually prescription um, up mm. a couple of years ago. 
if you get a 30 pack of the full strength stuff in Canada, you can only get the full strength. In the States, you can get it um, at like a quarter strength. But if you get the full strength stuff, the packets, unflavored, it's 450 billion colony forming units of bacteria per sachet. When you uh, have your, your little meal there in the morning, right, that's going to give you lots of fiber. And then toward the end of the day, at the very last part of the day, have that vis biome with a fiber supplement that is soluble fiber based. Okay. And put in five grams of glutamine. Okay. Mix that together in like, you know, six ounces of water or so and lick that back. And what you're doing then is at night, you're going to be colonizing your guts with a lot of really high quality bacteria. You're going to be supporting your gut lining with the glutamine. And you're going to be supporting the fiber colonization with that soluble fiber that's mixed in with it. Hmm. The next morning when you wake up, you're going to have that big high fiber meal, which is going to further feed that bacteria and carry it throughout the day until you hit it again the following night. Do that for four weeks. And I guarantee you, you'll be off to the races. You'll be having good poops. Good poops and, and your digestion will increase greatly. What happens then is you'll start getting hungry on the 1500 or 1600 calorie diet that you're doing, that you're trying to lose weight on. And you'll be able to increase your calories. And as you do pull yourself out of any sort of metabolic adaptation that you may be undergoing. And generally speaking, we see weight loss or fat loss at least increase within, you know, a few days after we get going on, you know, feeling good. So after we've done the 30 days and everything else. So you're talking about where people have been eating too little for too long and their metabolism has kind of shut down a bit. And so now they're exercising and under eating and not losing any of the body fat that they wanted to. And this is going to encourage their metabolism to ramp back up so they can eat more, perform better, and lose weight. Yes. So, so the first thing I don't like to say is that metabolism is, is broken or doing it. Actually, metabolism is responding exactly how it was evolved to respond. Mm. So, yes. Uh, so metabolism has now adapted to your low calorie intake and your high exercise activity. It's actually making you feel like shit because you are under caloried and still performing. So the idea is what happens when we get into metabolic adaptation is that our basal metabolic rate is going to stay relatively the same because that's what keeps all our bodily functions rolling, keeps us alive. Our um, tendency to move or our non-exercise activity thermogenesis goes in the tank. Okay. And when we look at total daily energy expenditure, you know, 70% of it is our, you know, our, our basal metabolic rate. Let's just call it that. But then the next biggest proportion of calorie burn uh, over time, like over months, not like in a given session, is going to be that non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is the uh, propensity to fidget. It's the one where you get up and walk over to the water cooler and talk for a few minutes, then decide, oh, I'm going to head upstairs and see Steve and accounting and then come back downstairs. All those movements start to go down as we adapt to the, um, the low calories. So behaviorally, we actually change the way we move. Hmm. Subconscious, it's driven by hormones. It's not, this isn't wizardry. So it's not a choice. It, and it's not by choice. So when you're an athlete, how you know this is because you have the motivation to still go do the shit, you know, when your body's saying not to. And there's probably, when, when your listenership is listening to this, there's probably a few people who will be, will be literally shaking their head and going, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. So if you measure, if you actually wear a wearable, which probably a lot of people are, you know, in, in, your, in your crew, yeah. take a look at your daily energy burn. Like just your, just your basal stuff, not from your exercise, but your, your energy burn. And what you'll see is over time that your energy burn through the day goes down. This isn't broken metabolism. This is less movement and it's less involuntary kind of, you know, 
subconscious movement, not the exercise part of it. When we reach that point, which a lot of us are in because we just are trying to, you know, lose that little bit of fat. Um, then we've, we've got ourselves in a little bit of a pickle because now our body's basically fighting what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Well, that's good. So you've given us a path to getting our gut healthy, which we can tell by having a good formed, regular poops. How we feel when we eat a meal, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. How fast, the, you know, we feel energy from the food, how long food sticks, sticks around the guts, those kind of things. Let's see, what other things like, uh, you know, is there any room for like highly processed foods that have chemicals in them that are, allow for the food to stay in a package for two years without rotting? Well, well, actually, it's funny because um, colors like, so, you know, artificial colors, artificial sweetener, chemical sweeteners, you know, like, you know, aspartame, ace K, these kind of things. There has been data to show impact in this, this kind of stuff. But that would be, I would say, if you're eating a whole food diet, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you had, you know, let's just say Gatorade. It's got some food coloring in it, whatever else, right? That's not going to be the reason why you aren't performing. Colors and all those things are kind of icing on the cake, minutia, um, that, you know, they do have an impact overall in the total load of shit you're eating. But overall, the calories that you get from a packaged food or a highly processed food are going to be mainly just the macronutrients. And then there won't be anything following behind it micronutrient wise, or at least not the abundance you'd get if you had a, a big high volume food plate, right? Which, which this is what we're talking about. I see. So, but here's the thing. If you take proton pump inhibitors for GERD, right? And for heartburn, these kind of things. So Prilosec, right? These, these kind of, acid reflux reducers. So proton, mm -hmm. protons are, are, are basically just acid. They're hydrogions. Um, so if you take a proton pump inhibitor or if you've taken a bout of antibiotics in the last, you know, well, if you had a bout of antibiotics in the last, you know, six weeks to a month and you're noticing gut health issues, that kind of stuff, there is a high likelihood those two things are kind of playing a role. So anybody who has that H. pylori infection, right? Mm. That's just a, you know, bacterium that's allowed to grow out of control it sits there all the time when we're in a commensal situation you know when we have enough good stuff but it can overgrow we don't anybody's had h pylori infection has treated it properly clinically they have taken a bout of really strong antibiotics that's to wipe out the bacteria it's not it's not h pylori specific and they're generally coming in with GERD first and then they get tested for h pylori so they're also on a proton pump inhibitor if your stomach acidity is low from the proton pump inhibitor and you've wiped out your microbiota, then you now can say beyond reasonable doubt that we need to do something, at least what I mentioned in the, uh, mm -hmm. the protocol. Um, and uh, like I was saying too, that if you find you're sensitive to a lot of foods, look for a low FODMAP food list to choose from for the first little while and then start reintroducing foods. Good resource okay. for that. No affiliation whatsoever is called, um, it's, it's a, it's a called Monash University online and they have an app and it actually can track your FODMAPs and that way you can, you can figure out which foods kind of cause those problems. So you, an elimination diet just to find the things that bug you, but then you need to add stuff back. Right. Not just live on a FODMAP diet for the rest of your life. Well, and that's, and it's funny, right? Because the low FODMAP diet, and I have actually a friend that's a big proponent of like acting like it's the diet. A low FODMAP diet is a bridge to good gut health. It's not, it's not just because it works well for you. Actually, because it works so well for you and, and, and FODMAPs don't, that tells us there's something wrong because those mm -hmm. are your fermentable fibers in general or fermentable sugars. So, you know, mm -hmm. fermental carbohydrates that are FODMAPs. Mm -hmm. So if you find that you need to use a low FODMAP approach, then use it until you feel that everything is subsided, poops are good, everything's regular, you did the protocol I gave you, and then you start reintroducing. And there's lots of resources for that online. Um, I, you know, I teach a course in this, you know, I coach a lot of people through this. But really, if you're, if you're, if you're smart, most athletes like to research for themselves, then, then just pull up some low FODMAP lists, start with that, and then start reintroducing. And you'll find that you'll build your guts back up. You'll be eating foods you didn't 
you didn't eat for a long time. Well, and you just walk the perimeter of the grocery store and find stuff that you haven't eaten. And you want to know what? That's with my clientele. I'll tell them, this week I want you when you're in the vegetable section just to grab something you don't even know what the heck it is. I want you to cook it. The only kicker with that one is if your guts are like are off and you know they are, you want to be very systematic with how you reintroduce foods. Hmm. Otherwise, the experiment is screwed because you know you're just you're rant. It's kind of like going in the lab and throwing chemicals at something and seeing what happens, but not writing a <laughs> book, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What do you think about this? I I had read some time ago about the American Gut Project, and they had done you know some testing of gut health and what people ate, and they came back with a recommendation that said. The people who eat 30 different plants a week, so not every day, but over time, if you're changing, you know, this day I eat these things and the next day I eat those things. And over over seven days, I eat 30 different kinds of plants. Those are the people with the healthiest guts. What do you think about that? Yeah, because the the variety breeds variety, right? It's it's form and function. So now let's go back to our lawn analogy real quick. When when, When we actually originally planted the seeds in the lawn, they probably weren't just one seed, mm. right? They're probably a mix. And the reason why we want that, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, whatever else is in there. It's the only one I can think of. We want to mix because we might have trees and shit in our backyard and some plants that are going to block some that, so we have ones that like sunlight. We have some that like drought. We have some that don't. Uh, we have some that, you know, don't need much fertilizer or food. We have some that, that need a lot. And that's what we do with the grass seeds. So think about that with, as your, like I was mentioning before, your bacterium, right? So the more diverse our diet in fibers, polyphenols, bright colors, um, protein sources, fiber so- uh, pure fiber sources, foods in general, mm-hmm. um, then the more diverse the food is for the bacteria and the better off our bacteria will be so long as the foods that we're feeding it are ones that are high in that nutrient density that we talked about. Gotcha. So the diverse microbiota is more stable over time. Diverse and dense is more stable over time when you get a diverse and dense, a nutrient dense diet. Yes. Awesome. All right. So, and what about some other things that have cropped up over the years and episodes here? Things like advanced glycation end products don't get caught up in minutia buy whole foods if your guts are really screwed and you know it's the things that you know bother you like onions and garlic and that kind of stuff yeah. stay away from them for a while stick to the simple whole food stuff and make your plate bright abundant in in in, in um fiber so it's going to be a big volume mm-hmm. and um, make sure you're getting like around 100 grams of vegetables per sitting in the meals Mm -hmm. and that's that's actually the low amount you know when we we really get down to it but the point is being able to start Mm. okay so if your listenership are concerned with caloric intake digestive distress any of that kind of stuff very first thing make it real easy when i coach you to this throw that fibrous breakfast i mentioned with the oats in there Mm -hmm. see how we respond with our normal day then add in, you know, a meal that includes, say, you know, a couple hundred grams of chicken, uh, you know, a half cup to a cup of cooked quinoa, a um, hundred grams of red peppers, a uh, hundred grams of zucchini, and some sauerkraut or kimchi that's not pasteurized with it. And then for, you know, dessert, have a green banana because the resistant starch is also an excellent way to feed those microbiota Mm. that's where i would that's how i would start it and i would just keep building out the meals from there because each time every day things will feel better that's the reinforcement the person needs to move on to oh well this is you know obviously you know having pizza every day at lunch or a hot dog off the coffee truck is not suiting me it's not serving my needs right because we're aging athletes right Mm -hmm. the high likelihood we've had physicals done and we've had blood work done Mm -hmm. and we could take a look at that. So we mentioned at the front end, you know, there's ways to measure inflammation in the body. And there is through blood tests, which is great. Mm-hmm. And you, you mentioned HSCRP as one of them. So uh, C-reactive protein, high sensitivity CRP is great to measure. A lot of physicians aren't really privy with the HSCRP thing. So we'll generally measure CRP because they want to see if you have some sort of 
you know, autoimmune disorder or um, an issue there because the range at which that assay is sensitive in is much higher than high sensitivity, obviously. The HSCRP assay was developed because of this low grade inflammation. But the range they give for that, even when they say like under one or whatever it is that they give in your case, HSCRP, once I have any athlete on enough calories, their training's matched, their caloric intake, and everything's going really well, guts are working well, should be in the fractions, well into the fractions. So 0.3, 0.2, 0.4 in there. Mm -hmm. And so CRP is one of them. It's a great one to have. If your CRP is high, if you're above 10, then you've got some underlying, some real issues. And that would be like leaky gut and stuff like that. If it has anything to do with digestion. Mm. Next one to get because of that is um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR. And that just measures how fast red cells actually settle at the bottom of the test tube. Mm. And elevated ESR is going to indicate the presence of inflammation generally associated with rheumatoid or some autoimmune thing, mm. but that allows us to then delineate, right? We can say, okay, maybe we have something else too. And if we do, that becomes even more important not to drive inflammation through diet. Those two, I would get measured like relatively frequent, a couple times a year as an athlete, at least. My athletes, some of them do it every four weeks, mm. but that, that's because of other uh, PEDs and stuff that they're using because they're not, they don't care about their life. The interleukins, you can measure. So those are the cytokines I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. But they don't need to be because um, generally I would have also um, ferritin measured in there. Mm. Okay. And so if you measure uh, CRP, HSCRP, your ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and ferritin. Ferritin is a protein actually that stores iron, mm -hmm. um, but also acts as an acute phase reactant to, to inflammation. Um, so if we see ferritin elevated and we also see HSCRP elevated, those two together can be indica indicative of a, a few things, but generally if digestion's off, we can get those two under control with those protocols I mentioned. Hmm. The other, other one that we, um, that we could uh, measure is uh, fibrinogen. So it's another acute phase protein that comes in in response to inflammation and when we see elevated fibrinogen, then it indicates ongoing inflammation. Mm. So if you had fibrinogen, ferritin, HSCRP, and uh, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate measured, you can do a little Sherlock Holmes on, on the different different uh, aspects. But if, there, if any of those are elevated, then any inflammatory insult is going to add to that inflammatory um, state. So one thing we know we can control is diet. And like I said at the beginning, the other thing we know that we can control is our stress levels. Some may say no, but we, we can. It's harder work. And then the other thing we know that we can control within all that is our sleep and recovery. Hmm. And so if we can get those together, we're in a lot better state because then we get rid of that low-grade inflammation. So those, those measurements are going to give us a true reading on where our inflammatory state sits. Hmm. If those none of those are elevated and we're good, then digestive stuff will be will make things really, really, really good. Very good. Your digestion on, on track will be really good. And then as long as your calories are high enough, and I always talk about them being high enough because we all, many people are just getting them far low enough. As long as your calories are high enough to sustain the exercise and you're assimilating the nutrients from the food that you're eating, then you're fueling the performance. And that is really, you know, the most valuable information you can give because there's no way to override poor diet with a supplement. There's no way to override poor diet that causes cardiovascular disease with a statin. There's no way to override any of it because all of those, the statins, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, all those things are temporary to get us to a state or an F us so that we can move or so that we don't have cardiovascular disease. But the key here is to, to make it so our, our system doesn't require those things 
if, as long as our genetics will allow so right yeah so within limits no one's going to live forever and things don't work as well over time but as the wheels fall off the train right we can't be over sabotaging the other wheels we got to grease those yeah. fucking <laughs> bearings so we can really move right yeah that's good okay so that's really good and related to this Maybe you've got a quick answer on it. This idea of you know not overeating and not undereating, it's not as simple as, oh, I'm going to calculate how many calories I burned when I rode my bike and my base metabolic rate is you know this and uh, I don't know, I'll throw a couple hundred for my fidgeting and that's how many I can eat. I think that it's more, there's a window of, and this is why people when they are undereating, their body stabilizes they'll lose weight and then they stop losing weight. And so there's this range in the amount that you eat and the amount that you're exercising should be with, this is me thinking out loud here, you gotta tell me what's true. You should have in mind this body and this life that you're trying to build. And there's an amount of food and an amount of protein maybe, that fits that formula for you that you need to figure out. And if there's any truth in what I have just rambled on and said, how do you help your clients figure that out? Yes. So really neat that we were on a athletes podcast, right? The wise athletes podcast. Yet most of the conversation that we've had has come back to fat loss and caloric restriction, right? Yeah because we're focused on the wrong thing, mm. right? So like I was mentioning a couple of times, you know, the whole biopsychosocial aspect of performance and health, um, which, you know, a lot of people are not promoting and some are, and they don't know they are, but the whole point behind is we aren't robots, right? Like we aren't, we aren't robots. And by over planning for aesthetics, we lose sight of the forest for the trees in performance. Yet, if we want to look like an Olympic athlete, trust me, there's not a single senior Olympic athlete or junior Olympic athlete or anything in in between or above or beyond that is focused on their physique. And if they are, they aren't optimized. Even if they're winning golds, they can break more records if they focused on performance. Give you a good example. I have um Olympic level rower, but he, there's no there's no class for him anymore because he's sixty. In my or sorry, paddler shit. Sorry, sorry, paddlers. I know they're not rowers. <laughs> uh, okay, paddler, kayaker. <laughs> this guy, this guy's fast. So um he, he's sixty, and so I help him every year get ready. We start in April, and he does the nationals in September. We just finished him up. Every year he gets better. At, at sixty, he's getting better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. and he's been doing this since he was a, a, like a kid. Like, and, and, and he told me this year, he said, you know, with my times right now, I'm beating when I was like in my 20s and 30s. Hmm. And he said, um, I would have been, in, yeah, I would have been on the national team when I was in my youth on this if I, did, if I employed this stuff. So our first year we worked together, he was like, I got to get leaner and lighter in the boat. And I said, well, you know, if you think about the physics of boats and everything else, Power is going to be more important to get you up out of the water than than being light. So we got to think about that. So anyway, we got him ripped and he loved it. He looked great. He looked like a total stud. He had veins coming to his abs, the whole nine yards. And the guy was, the guy's a machine. Does the nationals, he wins wins his class. He wins the the two classes that are his age group. And then there's another class that um, is uh, 25 plus. It's considered like veteran, right? And uh, he got fit the first time. So the last year, last couple of years has been working on power. So I changed his training. So we're timing his reps and doing all this kind of stuff. And we bumped his calories up slowly as we got him out of metabolic adaptation from the winter before that he was doing himself. And we got him up to over 31 or 3,200 calories over the course of the, the summertime up to race, race time. I think we're around 4,500 to 5,000 calories for the, for like, the three or four weeks that we were getting ready for the races. Wow. And previous years, he was around 27. So we almost doubled his calories. Um, his body weight went up by about pound and a half, two pounds. 
Uh, so his abs weren't as sharp or anything else. He was, he was actually complaining that he felt a little chubby. <laughs> he went in the boat in, on race day about seven or eight pounds heavier than he was the previous years. And that's because we glycogen loaded him and he had some body fat. He didn't have abs at all. He was definitely more, more body fat than he was when he came to me to start. And he went out this year and he killed every class and got like top three in the um in the uh the young classes so hmm. he podium and and the thing is he's winning by a length now because his, his other competitors i said the beautiful thing about this is that your other competitors are getting older well you're getting older and you're getting better yes. right so the gap is like crazy that is the effect of focusing on performance and not body fatness and it's funny because you look at the pictures and you'd be like, this athlete was better than this athlete. But body composition doesn't always come down to how many, you know, the best, what your abs play. Once we focus directly on our performance for athletes, right, that's what we want. We will perform better. We will fuel better. And if we don't care about the scale, there is a high likelihood if you're holding more body fat than you should be, that you're going to move the needle the other direction because you're just working that much harder. It's mm. hard to work hard when we have an empty fuel tank. Mm. It's really hard to work hard when our body has now metabolically adapted to that empty fuel tank and is now trying to stop us from performing. Right. You know, for those that are afraid to add calories into their, their diet, okay, like just all of a sudden, you know, they're eating 1,700 calories a day. They know they're under calorie, but they're really afraid to go up because every time they do the gain weight, Get those guts, start getting those guts in order. And then once you've got your caloric intake, you know, stable with your guts in order at whatever it was that you're maintaining at now, add a refeed in. I call them refeed meals. You've probably heard these before, but the refeed meal needs to be as full carbohydrate as possible. Fast carbohydrates are better than slow. Hmm. Um, so, so like, you know, um, more simple, sugar, more simple carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. I use pancakes for most of my athletes if they like wow. Um, and that one meal has to be enough to top up your calories to what you calculate as your total daily energy expenditure, including your work. So if you're showing on say chronometer, you're tracking your calories, you got all your shit coming in there and all the metrics and all looking at it. And you're like, I'm, you know, every day it's saying that I'm, a, you know, my, my, I'm 1100 or 1200 calories under maintenance. Mm -hmm. sort of thing. Then your meal needs to be 11 or 1200 calories, that one meal. And the key is that you eat all your other meals for the day and then you have to eat that one meal in one hour. Hmm. And the reason for that is because people love to take high calorie meals and spread them out through the day with donuts and shit like that. And they're like, oh, look at this. I can have like a couple donuts here. And no, 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 no. We're going to make it so this is really exciting to do and really hard to do at the same time. And then the next day, the amount of carbs that you ate, you can actually calculate what your weight gain is going to be within at least, you know, a half pound by just looking at the amount of carbs. Say, say you have, say you need to have 1200 calories and you eat, you know, 300 grams of carbs, the extra stuff outside of it amounts to another couple hundred calories, but big deal. It's a refeed. That 300 grams of carbs is going to get you each gram story is going to bring in another three grams of water with it so that it can sit as glycogen in muscle and liver and everything else, which will be depleted, especially if you're an endurance athlete mm -hmm. and under calorie. And so when it goes in as glycogen, it's going to come in with 300 grams. It's going to come in four times that. So you're going to have 1200 grams of weight gain to just give a rough estimate. That's 1.2 kilograms, which you're going to see a two to three pound increase in weight. Now everybody can go breathe nicely. That weight gain is not body fat. We can't put body fat on that fast. And what they will find is that day, like the next day after that dinner, they're going to feel amazing. They can have great performance. And then what will happen is slowly over the course of the next seven days, they will peter down. When you realize and you go, hey, that worked, take that, that calories that I, gave, that I just mentioned in that one meal. So say it was 1,500, um, let's, let's make it 14 to make it easy. Take it and distribute all those calories throughout your day and carbs. 
put another 200 calories in carbs, so 50 grams of carbs in each day to make up for that, that amount of calories in that refeed, you'll just feel better. Weight, weight will probably come down. Wow. Okay. And you got rid of the refeed once you spread the calories. That's right. Wash, rinse, repeat hmm. until you get to maintenance. Oh, you just keep doing this as you ramp up the calorie intake and the calorie burn. You, you'll, you'll lose body fat. And then the idea is behind it, you know, there's a little more, little more um, art to it, but the idea is that by checking in with yourself, I know my clients check in with me with pictures and everything else, but if you check in and you look at your performance, if performance is increasing as a result of just eating that food, then you ain't eating enough, <laughs> period. Yeah. Your performance can be volume, it can be speed, it can be power, it can be fucking get into the gym faster. Like if your day feels better, then you need the food. Right? Gosh, that sounds like a simple prescription. If you feel better and perform better by eating more, eat more. And, and you want know what's funny is that I feel so blessed to have the, you know, what I do be to listen to because it, it, it's really that simple. Now there's people with autoimmune disorders, there's people out there with all kinds of diseases and stuff like that, high blood sugar and all that. We can't just, you know, do a friggin' 1500 calorie you know, refeed with a fast sugar. Absolutely. We can't do that. There's minutiae that we have to deal with those, but we're a healthy athlete with healthy, healthy glycemic responses. And, you know, we're just generally kind of like, mm, things are just not like ever since I turned 50, like things aren't the same. And that, that is true. And I said, it wouldn't happen to me. It has. So, so when we feel like that, we are the canaries in the coal mine, the ones that are 50 plus. We're undergoing, you know, uh, some serious, uh, you know, muscle loss just because of aging. Um, and that's that sarcopenia that we have that's happening. Mm -hmm. It's been highly studied and we still don't know exactly what it is. Some of it's nerve, you know, can we activate the muscle hard enough? Some of it's, you know, metabolic or the mitochondria behaving enough. Right. But what we do know is that by eating like shit, drinking a bottle of wine every night, and being old is way worse than doing that when we're younger. <laughs> yes, yes. So we're canary Perfect. in the coal mine. And I like to think of myself as a real canary in the coal mine because I have a kidney transplant. And because I have a kidney transplant and I'm aging, I can notice things happening fast if I'm not doing the right thing. So, you know, we're none of us are immune to this aging shit, right? Right. Best thing I tell, tell everybody on here that's, you know, 40 plus. When you're 33, 34, that's when you first get the blood work that says there's something going sideways. And if you didn't, great, that's awesome. We're good. By 40, the behaviors that you know damn well are not contributing to your health, they're actually detracting from it, will start doing their job of taking away from your health. Mm. So if you haven't solved your you know, lifestyle problems by the time you're 40, your bad habits, yeah, yeah. better do it then. Because by 50, as we well know, it's a game of being able to sustain the workload of exercise that's going to get us places. And if we get out of shape in our 40s, we can't rest on the, the laurels of being a pro XYZ back when we were 20. Those two right. backs are gone. The older I get, the better I was. <laughs> and that's what you got. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. One of the biggest things I hear from the busiest older people, when I talk about performance, it doesn't matter whether it's performance as a parent or performance as a, you know, um, athlete that's, you know, mm. running ultras. The key here is really being able to have time for yourself to be able to have some self-care. Mm. You know, we're getting too busy. We need to give ourselves time to cook the meal. We need to give ourselves time to sleep. We need to give ourselves time to rest. Meditation is great, but it doesn't work if it's mechanical. So meditate. Use your, your times that you have to focus as meditation. Work's not meditation. For example, when you're cooking a meal and you're starting this process of 
bright colors and everything else and calories. Look at the meal while you're making it and think to yourself how amazing this looks. Like we order our food from, um, you know, the local, the whole local, you know, CSA stuff that you can get the box of stuff and everything. It's amazing because it's not, it's no more expensive. Yet it's fresh stuff and you never know what you're going to get. Right. And what's cool about it is even the point of ordering the food is exciting because there's always different shit. Mm. And it comes in, it's like today's our pickup day, right? So today we'll go get our food and then, and then we open it up. Oh, what do we have? And then you start planning meals. And what happens is you're meditating while you're doing the thing that you need to do to get your guts set up and, and get the inflammation down and get the calories in. When you sit down and eat it, you'll be, you know, when you cook it, if you get excited and you plate it like you mean it, right? So you got the color different, almost like you're going to take a picture for Instagram, right? Mm. When you sit down to that meal, it'll be one of those, like, rub your hands together before you eat it and, 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 and get ready. And when you do that, you've just spent, you know, 40 minutes to an hour meditating and all meditation mm -hmm. is being present. The only reason why we have to do meditation now to, you know, especially in our older age, because we're too busy to sit down and not think. Mm. And you had early in the talk talked about uh, mindful eating and instead of sitting in front of the TV or in front of the computer. Or running out the door, Right. And you're not even, you don't even taste the food. Nope. It's just, it's just protein and fiber and stuff going into my stomach that I had to have anyway, but you, you've lost something. If you, if you're not experiencing how delicious it is, mm -hmm. then you've lost something. A hundred percent. Yep, exactly. And it's funny. I, and I eat mechanically, like, like I, I, used to, I used to call it fuel for, you know, 30 years probably. Um, force feeding and everything else. And I was fortunate enough, you know, to have like a really good, really high, high, good digestion. In fact, I was chubby when I was younger and it was because I just assimilate like mad. Right. And that's why bodybuilding worked really well. Um, but the point is exactly that man is, is, is that first of all, supplements, like I said, like, you know, are, are great things. But if you, if you focus with supplement instead of supplements, you focus on whole foods You've covered yourself really well because that's where we steal the shit to make the supplement. From. So right off the bat, whole foods great, and just like that, we've all of a sudden now, uh, you know, with whole food, we put ourselves in a position where we're getting more micronutrients or fiber and everything else too. When we mindfully eat, we've now covered the meditation aspect of the mid afternoon, the morning, mid afternoon, and evening. Hmm. And so by the time we're done our dinner, really, if we have a snack or something like a you know, yogurt bowl or something like that at 7.30 or so at night, and we're focused on it, making it, and we're excited about putting the nutritional yeast in for the first time or something like that, right? Hmm. Um, and, we get, and we're excited about it. Then just before we go to bed, we'll also have a little thing that we're going to focus on. And the cool thing is, while you're getting excited about it, you're doing it because we taught this podcast, and you know it's going to increase performance, so that's why I'm doing it. And I know it's going to decrease inflammation, so I'm going to do it. And then it does, right? Or it bloats you, right? Either way, if it works, perfect reinforcement. If it bloats you, perfect reinforcement that we need to do more work on this gut health thing. Mm -hmm. As you become more mindful when you eat, it reinforces the reasons why you're eating what you're eating and you actually just found space. And that's what we all have trouble doing is finding that gap of time. And what ends up happening is if they looked at their heart rate and everything while they're eating, they're going to notice their heart rate goes down and everything else because that's that parasympathetic state that we need to be in the rest and digest state that we need to assume mm. nutrients. So the last thing I'll say is that for those, for those people, sorry, out there that are on the toilet and they see solid food in the toilet, mm. right? you're sensitive to that food because it's not getting digested. So right off the bat, you know, if it's a low FODMAP, what's even you know, worse because you know that your digestive state isn't ideal. So, you know, we've all, we've all done it, right? We've all ate a big thing of mushrooms or a big thing of blueberries or whatever. And they reassemble themselves. Like you're like, mm -hmm. I know I chewed at least a couple bites. <laughs> <laughs> How did that reassemble in the toilet? Right. Yeah. I hate to think you've been sneaking into my bathroom, but, there you go, right? So, so you know, there's lots of ways for us to tell 
most of us implicitly, you know, know whether or not we're digesting well and know whether we're eating the right stuff. Yeah. As athletes, the key is if we're mindful, we can't be in denial. Denial is what takes us away from mindfulness, right? Mm. And so mindfulness simply means presence. It simply means being here right now like I am with you. And I'm not thinking about anything else around me, but mm. this conversation. And in doing so, I've given myself space. I've given myself that time. And that will improve everything, not just digestion, but it'll just trickle down into better performance in the gym, better everything, because you'll stop rushing to the gym with that meal in your hand and lower chronic inflammation and that's the key and then you know it all comes down to stress mm. and we're not just talking about mental we're talking about digestive stress or distress yeah. we're talking about work distress we're talking about workouts or training or performing that is no longer you stress because we're not eating enough it becomes a distress mm. and when we do all that, that loads inflammation. And when we lower that, it does just the opposite. Fantastic. Okay. Well, this has been uh, really, I mean, mind-blowing. Thank you very much. Before we cut off here, though, tell our audience how they can find you. Absolutely. So um, I am most easily reached, if you want to DM me, I answer my DMs, um, um, on Instagram at Jackson. I, um, I'm also on all the other socials, but that one I'm quite active on. I also uh, have a new website going to be coming out. Check it out, hopefully in the next month, www.vitalitymanifesto.com. And uh, you can also reach me if you want to um, via email at duane at drduanejackson.com. All right. I'll get all that in the show notes. Dr. Jackson, thank you very much. It's an extreme pleasure. And if you want to get on here and talk again, by all means, just get hold of me. I know how to reach you, and I will take you up on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining my conversation with Dr. Dwayne Jackson. You can find more information about Dr. Jackson in the show notes.